Good morning, everyone. I am on day two of my Illinois and surrounding states adventure. This is my sister's 2017 Chrysler Pacifica that I'm borrowing for a week to go on adventures. I'm standing in front of this mound right here. This is not natural. This is man-made. This is the largest Native American earthwork north of Mexico. It's about 100 feet high. It is gigantic. This is called Monk's Mound, and I am at Cahokia. Native Americans built mounds like this across the eastern U.S., but this is home to the largest of them. And Cahokia was a city. It was a proper Native American city. It lasted from about 1050 to about 1350, about 300 years. And at the peak, there were hundreds and hundreds of mounds here. I think at least a few hundred mounds. I think there are several dozen still extant, but this one is called Monk's Mound, and it is the largest of the mounds. And from walking along the path here, I can see a bunch of other mounds. All of these are man-made. These are all Native American mounds. Here are some facts about the mound. It covers 14 acres, it's 100 feet tall, contains 22 million cubic feet of earth. There used to be a building on top of the terrace that was 48 by 104 feet, and construction lasted between 950 and 1250. This is what Monk's Mound would have looked like back in the day. There would have been buildings on the different terraces with, with ramps or stairs leading up the different terraces up to the next one. And then on top would have been this just gigantic building here. And that building on top would have been home to the religious and political leader of the area of Cahokia. And the mounds served different purposes. It seems that the smaller ones were mostly burial mounds. Some of them have been excavated and hundreds of bodies were discovered underneath. And it's thought that when an important leader died or a warrior that several people would have been killed along with them, would have been sacrificed along with them, mostly women. Here's the mound or the pyramid from across the little road here. It's a fairly busy road and there's a, a full-on highway, a loud highway on the other side here. What an incredible thing. And again, to zoom in for scale, there are people. And this is called Monk's Mound, by the way, because in the early 1800s, Trappist monks lived on top of a nearby mound, a nearby hill, and they had planted crops and, and fruit trees on the terraces of Monk's Mound here. And then here's looking out at the area from the top of the stairs leading up the mound here. Again, lots of mounds in the area that you can see. And this over here is St. Louis. Of course, the most notable feature of St. Louis is the arch, is Gateway Arch. I think I'm gonna go visit that later in the day. So there used to be mounds in St. Louis and on the east side of the river. So St. Louis is in Missouri and on this side of the Mississippi River is Illinois. There used to be mounds on both sides of the river over there, but they've all been destroyed, sadly. And this is the view on top of the mound. So in front, I believe it's in this direction, there used to be a gigantic plaza, a huge, huge plaza. And that plaza was the size of 35 football fields, about 1,600 feet by 900 feet. Again, imagine that basically 50 foot by 100 foot building up here. Imagine looking out over hundreds of other mounds in the area. It's just amazing. 
It seems like there's some confusion and misunderstanding as far as what the largest pyramid in North America is. I know that the Great Pyramid of Cholula in Mexico is huge. I think that's the biggest one. And then the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan is up there. Uh, I've been to that one. I've been to Teotihuacan in Mexico. It's incredible. Probably one of the most spectacular things I've seen on my travels. And then this one has been called the largest in North America, the largest in the United States. Uh, I don't think it is the largest in America. It might depend on how you define it, like maybe by volume. Maybe they're talking about just packed earth pyramids and not stone pyramids or stone covered pyramids. I don't know, but however you slice it, it's huge and <laughs> it's really impressive. Just think of the time and manpower and resources required to build something like this. It's just insane. I read that it would be the equivalent of 7,000 semi-trucks full of dirt. And that would have taken just millions of man hours and millions of basketfuls of dirt, which is probably how it was built. People just unloading baskets of dirt on top of one another. It's just crazy. And surrounding Monk's Mound and the Grand Plaza would have been this, or something like this, but more impressive. This is kind of a rickety looking reconstruction. What would have been here back in the day is a two mile long wall surrounding the area. Two mile long stockade made out of big old trees, probably six to 12 inches in diameter, dug four to five feet down deep into the ground, and the height of these would have been about 12 to 18 feet. And so the core of Cahokia would have been a heavily fortified walled city. There would have been towers or bastions spaced out at intervals along the wall. Several sources I read said that this is considered the only Native American city, like proper city that the Native Americans ever had. At its peak in around 1100, 1200 time frame, it was bigger than London at the time. So the population here at the peak was between 20 and 30,000. So that little piece of reconstructed wall is where I just was. There's another section of reconstructed wall right here. This one is partially mudded over or plastered over. And it's thought that the original wall would have been plastered over like this too. You can see the kind of the towers sticking out from the wall. Of course, the Native Americans didn't leave written records. And so a lot of what we know or think we know about this place is, is a mixture of archeological work and guesswork, just kind of putting together the pieces and, and coming up with the, the best logical explanation for things. But even so, it's not entirely clear how or why this place was founded, was started, or how it ended. As far as why it was founded, it seems like Cahokia was a planned city. There used to be a, a smaller village on the same site here that archaeologists call Old Cahokia. This is New Cahokia. Old Cahokia was systematically dismantled. It wasn't destroyed by like fire or war. It was dismantled and then this was built on top of it systematically and with a plan kind of in one stretch. And so the thought behind that is that maybe there was a new religion that was being created and that New Cahokia was built here in honor of that religion as part of that new religion. And then as to why Cahokia declined, again, there are various theories and we're not entirely sure if any one of them is the single reason. It could have been a combination of various things. Things like internal strife, external warfare, climate change, like maybe it started raining too much or there was a drought, which would have messed up the farming in the area on which the people who lived here would have relied on. Because uh, a place like this with, you know, 20,000 people isn't self-sustaining in a small geographical area. You need people outside of the city farming and making things for the people people that would have lived here. And so if something happened out there where all the farms are or whatever, then obviously that would have had a, a big major effect on, on the city here. But of course, I'm not a historian. I'm not an archeologist. If you wanna learn more about Cahokia, there are a few different resources that I would recommend. First of all, just read the Wikipedia page. Second of all, there is a 40, 
four minute or 45 minute long YouTube video from the History Channel on YouTube. It's a documentary with Leonard Nimoy narrating and it's a, it's a quick and pretty easy watch or listen. And then third, there's this book called Cahokia, Ancient America's Great City on the Mississippi. Uh, this is a small book, it's about 170 pages. Uh, again, easy to read, it's, it's well written, it's engaging, it's not like a dry academic text. It's written for a general audience and so if you are interested in learning more about this place, I highly recommend this book also. I'll put a link to it in the video description along with links to the Wikipedia page and the, the, the Leonard Nimoy narrated History Channel documentary. And then when this place was abandoned, which again could have been for various reasons, it's unclear exactly where the inhabitants all went. It's probable that they didn't all go as one great body somewhere. It's most likely that they split up and each went off in different directions, possibly in the places where they had originally come from or where their ancestors had come from. But there is, for example, no one modern tribe that you can look at or point to and say, okay, they are the descendants of the Cahokians. got a good look at a few different mounds here. There's this one right here on the left, this one right here on the right, and then Monk's Mound back in the distance, partially visible. And then behind me here is what's called a Barrow Pit. This is a pretty large one. Can't really tell, can't really see it very well, but this is a big pit where earth was taken to build the mounds. There's one more mound that I want to see here. I mean, there are a ton of mounds. You could spend a long time exploring this area. There's one mound that's famous, even though right now I don't think it looks especially spectacular, but uh, it's very interesting. I think I can find it. Ah, a bug just flew into my eye. I don't know if you saw that. Um, anyway, this, this mound that I'm looking for is off in the forest somewhere to the south here. So this little bump here is the mound that I wanted to see. It's called Mound 72. And there's some wild turkeys over there. I don't know if you can see them. It's kind of fun. The mound itself isn't too impressive. I'm guessing it was a little bit more prominent before undergoing extensive archeological digs, but some of the most impressive finds at Cahokia have been found in this mound here. And it was actually made up of a few different mounds that were covered over to make one bigger mound. There's a good little diagram of that right here. And this also shows where various burials were. These little circles represent burial areas. And as long as we're here showing this, look at all of these arrowheads. Hundreds and hundreds of arrowheads were found in this site. In fact, it was a cache of arrowheads. And along with that cache of arrowheads, was a cache of 36,000 beads made from shells. Here's another cache of arrowheads that was found. Here's yet another cache of arrowheads that was found. And then here is a cache of chunky stones. So these are circular rocks that have been kind of hollowed out on each side there. And so that was for a game called Chunky. And so one person would take the the that stone, the chunky stone, roll it, kind of like a bowling ball, and then people would throw sticks, kind of like spears or javelins, trying to, to land with their points next to where the chunky stone landed. It was apparently a really popular game, and it lasted for hundreds of years, even after Cahokia disappeared. Chunky was still a uh, popular game among Native Americans. It was observed by early European travelers in the area. The diagrams on this sign here show what various burials would have looked like. So here's one burial with 39 bodies in it. This is an interesting one. Four men decapitated and without their hands buried next to 53 young women. And probably the most famous one is this this bird man burial. So there's this platform covered in, in marine shell beads in the shape of a bird. You can see the little bird head right there. And then this man was buried on top of the bird shaped platform with a couple other people around him. He's thought to be uh, one of the leaders of Cahokia.
You can see just from that how rich and complicated the culture and society of this area must have been. And it's just so sad that we don't know much about it because so many other mounds were destroyed or looted before archaeologists, you know, proper archaeologists got a, a good look at them, were able to take a good look at them. All of that history, all of that culture, all of that knowledge was lost. Completely apart from the fact that, of course, it was a burial ground, presumably a, a sacred site, and then it was violated. So, just sad all around. And then there's one more thing that I wanted to see here at Cahokia and show you guys. Need to walk back to the car and drive uh, not too far down the road here to get to our last destination of of this area. So this this spot is a state historical site. It's called Cahokia Mound State Historic Site. And the last place I'm going to visit is still within the, the park here, just down the road a little bit. You've heard of Stonehenge, and this is the Native American equivalent of that. This is called Woodhenge, and it's essentially a solar calendar. There are a few dozen of these large poles arranged in a circle, a large circle, and there is a central pole in the middle right there. And so the idea is that you stand in that center pole and from there, you can observe the various important stages of the sun. So for example, the, the winter and summer solstices and the fall and spring equinoxes. So for example, on the summer solstice, you stand in the middle and the sun will, be, will rise perfectly aligned with this pole. Or for the fall equinox, it'll be perfectly aligned with this pole, you know, whatever, as seen from that central pole. So really interesting. This is the original location of the pole, or of the, uh, of the henge, of the circle. These, of course, are not the original poles. And again, this dates back to about a thousand years ago, around the, uh, the 1100s. And then right behind me is another mound. Doesn't look like much, but there is a small mound here. And I think that'll do it for my time here at Cahokia. Really interesting place. I highly encourage you to visit if you haven't already. You know, read up on it, read about its history so you know exactly, well, not exactly, but you know roughly what you're looking at here and, and the kind of place that this was back in its heyday. I'm really happy I was finally able to make it here after a, a really long time of wanting to. I'm gonna leave here now and head into St. Louis, or at least toward St. Louis. I'm gonna go see some other interesting things today. I think actually though, the first thing I'm gonna do is not all that interesting. I'm gonna go to Walmart and uh, pick up some supplies. All right, and here is the final result, final Walmart haul. Got some snacks on the left side there and then just a few accessories that I've been missing on this trip. I wanted a spray bottle that I can fill with water, makes brushing my teeth easier. A couple of automotive towels. These are really absorbent towels because this morning when I woke up, there was a lot of condensation on the windshield and I used paper towels, but these would be better. And then this little Ozark Trail lantern. Let me see if I can do this one-handed. Can I open it one-handed? I cannot. There. Little solar lantern that can also be charged via USB. All right, let's pack up and head into St. Louis. All right, I'm now in downtown St. Louis. I parked in this parking garage right here. The arch is somewhere over this way. I think I'm gonna rent a scooter and ride over there. Okay, this is a bird scooter. I've got the bird app on here. Let's see, which one is this? Okay, I think I'm ready to go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. What a beautiful thing. Wait, wait. To cross the port at Walmart. That is so cool. I have been to, well, I have been through St. Louis before. I remember seeing the arch when I was a kid. On a family road trip, we drove through or past St. Louis, and I remember seeing it. But man, in person, that is so cool. In person and up close, I mean, obviously. That is amazing.
Okay, the scooter wasn't going. I realized that I've entered a no ride zone. Uh, there was another scooter parked back here, so I'm gonna go park the scooter next to, uh, to the other one. I know there are areas like schools and airports and skate parks where you're not allowed to ride these scooters. Like they're, they're geo-fenced, so you can't drive them. You can't park them in those places. And I guess this is also one of those places, probably because I, I think it's in the National Park Service. I think it's a national park unit of some kind. So I guess that makes sense. Now, I never really realized how big this thing is. It is 623 feet tall. The world's largest arch. St. Louis has been nicknamed the Gateway of the West, or Gateway to the West, and so that's why it's called Gateway Arch. Uh, Lewis and Clark started off their journey here from St. Louis back in the day. And before that, it was a French outpost, a French trading outpost, and so a lot of history here in St. Louis regarding the, the westward expansion of the United States, and this arch is just, it's a sight to see. To give you an idea of the size of this thing, the scale of it, here are some people. Just remarkable, what a thing. What a beautiful, weird, wonderful thing. It was built in the 60s, took about two and a half years to build from 1963 to 1965. So not that old. I thought it was older than that, but relatively new. And here it is in all of its glory from the back. My lens isn't wide enough to get the entire thing in. And then on this side, behind me, is the Mississippi River. Looks like you can drive right down here. I didn't realize that. You can drive right behind the, the arch, right along the water here. That's really neat. That, of course, behind me on the other side of the river is Illinois, and I am in Missouri. Let's go stand right underneath the thing now, right underneath the arch. You know, I think this might be the single coolest, I want to say man-made thing that I've seen in the US. I think this is just so amazing. It's definitely the best, I don't know, monument that I've seen. Okay, I'm directly underneath it. I'm guessing that's the observation area. You can ride up into the arch. I'm sure that taking the elevator up, riding up into it is, is great and worth doing. I don't want to take the time to do it today. I saw online that tickets are really hard to come by anyway because of COVID. Uh, they have reduced numbers of, ooh, this ground is very swampy and, <laughs> and mushy here. It's hard to get tickets anyway, so I'm just not gonna, not gonna worry about it. It'll give me a good reason to come back to St. Louis. And speaking of St. Louis, let me show you the, the skyline here. Some of it is obscured by those trees there, but We've still got a, a good look at it here. Part of it anyway. All right, next up on the list is outside of town. It's about 35 minutes north of St. Louis. Uh, I think it's back on the Illinois side of the river actually. So let's head over that way. And just like that, I'm back in Illinois, right next to the Mississippi River. And I've come here to see this. This is the Piasa, which is a Native American mythological creature. Now, a couple of centuries ago, there was a, an actual Native American painted image on a cliff about a mile downstream. That painting eventually basically wore away and was quarried, that cliff was quarried. So this is a replica, just a modern replica. But originally, there was a large, basically a giant pictograph painted on the rocks, again, about a mile this way. And it was the largest Native American painting ever seen. And like I said, the Piasa was a legendary creature that would carry off men as well as large animals. And imagine being, imagine canoeing up the river here and coming around the bend and seeing something like this. An early European traveler who came through the area in 1673, Father Jacques Marquette, said that the monsters were so well painted that we cannot believe that any savage is their author, for good painters in France would find it difficult to reach that place conveniently to paint them. And this is a, 
think this is a sketch of what they saw. In the cliff behind the painting, there are these huge caves. These are not natural caves. These are quarry caves from limestone quarries here from uh, I think the early 1900s. And it looks like there's a trail that leads back into the caves. So let's go take a closer look. This is wild. I mean, the, the height of the caves here from the floor to ceiling is probably a good 30 or 40 feet. Kind of creepy <laughs> inside here, but an interesting place to visit nonetheless. Now I don't remember where I'm going next, so I'm gonna get back to the car, check my notes, see what I feel like doing, and I'll see you guys at the next spot. Well, I'm the only person at this next spot. This is a state park. This place is called Edward, Ted, and Pat Jones Confluence State Park. It is the point where the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers come together, the confluence of two, arguably the two great rivers of the United States. And here we have it, a quick little five minute easy walk down the path has led us to the point, to the confluence itself. This is the Mississippi River. This is the Missouri River. And this point right here, right there, right in the middle, that's where they meet. It's amazing to think of all the history that's gone down here. You know, Lewis and Clark coming up from, from below, from St. Louis, coming up the Missouri River here, heading onward. And I'm sure the river has changed course over the last couple hundred years, so it's not this exact spot that they passed by, but still really neat to be here. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun for me to, to be at this spot where the Missouri River ends, basically, because I live about 60 or 70 miles as the crow flies from the start of the Missouri River. It's on the side of a mountain that's on the border between Montana and Idaho. I've driven past it a bunch of times. If you've been to West Yellowstone, you've been pretty close to it. The source itself is a little spring on the side of the mountain. I've never been up there. I've never been to that spring, but the stream that comes down from the spring is called Hell Roaring Creek and I have actually fished that creek before. So it's kind of fun. And with that, it's time for dinner. Let's head back into St. Louis. So, last week when I was planning this trip, I searched for interesting restaurants in the St. Louis area because I figured I'd probably be here around dinner time. And I found one. I found an Afghan restaurant. From looking at pictures of it online, plus looking at the menu of the restaurant, it looks like it's a mix of Central Asian and Indian cuisines, which I guess makes sense since it's situated, you know, between the rest of Central Asia and India, or and Pakistan, anyway. So. Let me show you what I got here. I've got some baklava here. I love baklava, looks good. Got a Coke, and this is the main attraction. Look at that. It looks beautiful, it smells amazing. So this is called Chicken Sultani. Let me read to you from the menu here. A combination of grilled chicken kebabs and a strip of kubita kebab served with chalo rice, naan, and a dollop of green peas and potato stew. So this is the chicken kebab. 
I have no idea what a kubita kebab is. Is that lamb? I'm not sure. And then there's the, the dollop of green peas and stew with the rice and naan. So I just looked up kubida or kubida and it's an Iranian meat kebab made from ground lamb or beef, often mixed with ground pepper and chopped onions. Sounds good. I need to kind of hurry up and eat this and then get on the road. I have a couple of hours to driving to, to reach a campsite for tonight. So I'm not gonna film my reactions to eating this or anything like that. And you don't wanna see me eat anyway, that's kind of gross. But I'll eat this and then I'll let you know how it was once I reach camp. Well, about two hours later, it's 20 minutes or so after sunset. It's pretty darn dark, but I found a campsite. I'm in Mark Twain National Forest in Missouri. Beautiful little spot here. But yeah, really fun day. I had a great time today. Saw some really interesting and beautiful things. Cahokia was great. Gateway Arch was great. I really liked learning more about the Piasa creature. And then the confluence was really neat. I loved seeing the drone footage where you could see the two different colors of the two different waters coming together. Oh, and the Afghan food, by the way, was, was good. I liked it. It wasn't amazing, but I liked it. And I still am not sure if that was beef or lamb, that other thing, but whichever it was, it was really flavorful and, uh, and I enjoyed it. It was, it was fun trying a new cuisine. That's always a, a fun thing to do. And then the drive here from St. Louis was beautiful, beautiful country here, just kind of rolling hills, beautiful trees, beautiful little farms. It's kind of a mixture of pastoral countryside and forest that I thought was really pretty. And I didn't film any of it, but uh, I'm gonna be in this area all day tomorrow. So be sure to stay tuned if you wanna see more about this part of Missouri. And let me know what you think. How did you guys like this video? I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say about my travels in places that aren't the West. Should I do more of this kind of thing? Let me know if I should. Uh, hit the like button on this video. That's always appreciated, and that's a good way for me to know if a video really resonates with you guys or not. So thanks for watching. Let me know what your favorite part was, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.